Good morning, everybody, and welcome. How is everyone doing today? Get started here in just one minute. Make sure that everything is working, everybody can hear me. <clears throat> this is the first time going live in the new studio, so um, <laughs> it's going to take me a moment. Hopefully, um, it has been a while. Oops, see, already. It's been a while since I've you've seen my face here on um, YouTube. So welcome everyone. We are, it's been a little chaotic first half of the year. One, I don't know how it's already June and of that almost the middle of June. Um, we have finally have the studio up and functioning. So we are getting there slowly but we can function and operate inside of here so that is the best part so let me just check some things all right so this morning if you're joining us this morning we are here to begin our adventure with wander lane so we're going to be spending some time this morning here going over not only the three piece blocks from this month's um, program, from this month's blocks, but we're also going to spend a little bit of time talking about fusible machine applique because I know you're all accomplished quilters and we'll have no problems doing these piece blocks. We're still going to go over it, but it's really what you're here for is to um, use the um, blanket stitch or how you're going to get these particular items stitched down to your uh, background fabric. So we're going to talk about some tips and tricks that we have for you this morning on how to do this. And obviously by the time that we get to the end of this adventure, you are going to be a pro at this um, function. All right, so let's come on over and let's talk about the pattern booklet and how we read it and function with it, okay? So in here, the first thing that I would do is I would open it up and I would remove the pattern sheet page. Okay, so take out this middle section They so nicely. Um, if you have the booklet version, um, some of them were later done or earlier done as like in a plastic sleeve. Um, she's now turned them into individual books. So you'll want to um, pull out the pattern diagrams because we're gonna need this to make sure that we get everything placed correctly. And then we're going to be working specifically on portions of the Shamrock Ridge quilt, which is this little guy right here. And I've already got my little, let me get my little tape off of here. We are only in your kit or your block of the month that you received from Material Girls or maybe from another store. Um, we have done it where you've received the fabrics that you need to make the piece block, I mean, the applique block, and then the three pieced blocks that would need to be for the final assembly of the full quilt. If this is too much and you're like, I don't really need a full giant quilt, I would much rather have a um, individual wall hangings or something along that lines. We do have um, put together and up on our website, and I'll put a link in here in a little bit, the finishing kit if you want to make the project just like the small quilt here on the front, okay? It's a 30 by 30 quilt, uses those same three applique blocks, the three blocks, you just make 
four of everything instead of one of each style of pieced block. So completely up to you and we will be doing that um, each month as well for you if you decide there is a particular month that you would prefer to do the um, individual wall hanging. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the um, inside. We're going to go into page two and I kind of want to go over the cutting first and the blocks or which fabric goes to what really um, so that we can make sure that everything is good because some of the images are going to be different because if you look at the house applique on the front of the book is different than the fabrics used for the house applique block in the back of the book and so you if you started and were like these aren't the fabrics that are in my box my kit we actually have the fabrics that are done in this particular quilt and mostly because that's different because of when you assemble it into a quilt it may butt up to another color so that's why in the this particular one this is a white background not blue like it is on the front because then it would just it'd be a lot of that same blue across the quilt so just depending upon how it was done uh, typically we will reference and in your kits will be the fabrics that you see on the full quilt okay so <clears throat> excuse me i'm going to skip the house block for a moment and we're going to look at the disappearing four patch that's in the booklet so the disappearing four patch let me show you the two fabrics that the disappearing four patch are going to be made of okay so the disappearing four patch is going to be this um, white with this little confetti piece one second let me um so you can see okay this white with this confetti piece and then the green um, cross or grid type pattern. This is going to be your disappearing nine patch fabrics. We need to cut your um, two pieces that are needed. You need a four by eight rectangle for each of those. Okay, that's that block. The next block is going to be the square and a square block. The square and a square block is going to use the white fabric with the berries. It's going to use this green vine print. And then it's going to use the house fabric. Okay. In your kit, you have a very big piece of house fabric. Okay. You just need a three and a half inch square out of this. So you can pick the house that you want. Maybe you cut one, you made a mistake, you've got plenty. Okay. So you can choose whatever you would like in that particular house um, as to which one you want. You've also got extra that you will pretty much every month you're going to get a big piece. So you'll be able to maybe pick the house that you want. Maybe the house that you want for next month you really can't get out of that piece. You may be able to come back to a previous piece and get what you need out of it. Okay, so you need a three and a half inch square. Now, I highly recommend that you dig through your ruler stash, find yourself a three and a half inch square ruler, okay, or cut yourself a three and a half inch square piece of uh, cardstock, um, template plastic, something along that line, so that you can lay that over top of your house and figure out which one that you want. Now I have a, a Marty Michelle perfect um, template here. It's a three and a half inch square from um, set uh, the three inch square set. Everybody makes um, Creative Grids, OmniGrid. They all make a square ruler. I'm sure you have one in your stash. And basically, what I did is I kind of you know laid it down on top of the house that I wanted. 
And then you can, if you're comfortable, you can feel free to go ahead and rotary cut all the way around that um, square, or you could take a marking pen of some sort and draw around it and then remove the smaller square and come back and cut it with scissors or cut it with a rotary cutter and a different ruler. So for me, these rulers don't have any um, grip to them. So <clears throat> I'll be very careful if I'm gonna cut around it or I would draw it and then come back with my standard rotary cutting ruler um, and cut it, okay? So that's a three and a half inch square that goes into your um, square in a square block. Okay. Now I will tell you there is just enough of this fabric. So don't get overly trimmed or anything along that line. There's just enough to get your two four and a half inch squares out of it. This block she does the square and a square block. They are oversized and then we trim down to the size that we need. So even if this is slightly not exactly four and a half, it's okay. We will be trimming the block down to size um, once we have it assembled. Okay. And then the final block is the shamrock block. Okay. So in the shamrock block, <clears throat> I would make this one the last one that you cut. Your background is going to be this, uh, they call it whisper weave, okay? So this basic tone on tone type print. And then you are going to use all the greens that were in your kit, okay? And cut yourself 12 two inch squares, okay? So you're gonna need an assortment of two inch squares. There is no right or wrong as to the number that you use, how many of them you use. It's completely up to you um, of your color combinations. You can, if you like, look at the images that are in the um, front cover and make it just like that. <clears throat> and then we have, for me, I chose to make the darker whisper weave print my stem, okay? But as you can see, you have plenty of fabric, okay, to be able to do what you would like with the colors that you would like, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. One other bit of piecing that doesn't fall into those three blocks is under the house block, okay? There is one, a background, and there is a bottom checkerboard border, okay? So our background needs to be cut and pieced before we can do any of the applique, okay? So I cut according to the chart in the book. This is A, this is B, this is C. You can do this in any order you like, okay? It does not matter. And then the bottom checkerboard is done out of the cross and the little scallop. But again, this is your quilt. You have plenty. You can choose um, which ones that you would like. Okay. So <clears throat> I have already pieced my three background rectangles together at a quarter of an inch seam and I've pressed those seams open, okay? So they're all pressed open for us. And then I've gone ahead and I have done the same steps in step six and seven under the house block. I basically pieced, strip cut these, and then sewed these together. Do not attach these to the bottom of your block yet, okay? We have a background piece, a hill, that's going to get fused here at the bottom, and then we will attach this strip, okay? That way this raw edge of this fused, uh, this background hill, will get caught in the seam allowance, and we won't have to blanket stitch that particular one down, okay? All right. That's kind of your basic uh, fabrics. In your kits, 
you will find that you have your laser cut pre-fused ready to be used pieces. Now you're going to find some pieces that are held together with like a connection. These will get cut. We just have them here because they were cut out of the same fabric and then these um, don't get lost or anything along that lines. They're not going to stay attached just like with the shamrock. Okay, And then in the baggies we have these smaller, all the smaller applique pieces as well as buttons. With these buttons, they are used um, in the shamrock quilt, but some of the extras are also used in some of the other projects. Okay, so you have the full set of buttons to do any of these particular projects that are here um, in your book. Okay. Um, it's just easier for us to do this than to give you one or two little individual baby buttons to get lost um, that's in there. So we have the button that's needed for the middle of the flower and the button that is needed for the doorknob. Okay, And then like you said, I, you've got buttons that could be used for this, um, this little sheep's eye and there's a button in the middle of this little guy too. So you have some extras in case you want to make design changes. We're going to come on over to the ironing board now and we're going to look at how to lay out and do this fusing. Okay. All right. Let me get everything over here. that you can see. Okay. All right. Now, I have taken my background now that it is um, assembled and I have done a little starch on it to give the fabric a little bit of body. We're going to be putting some stitches and things into this particular um, fabric and I want to kind of help minimize wrinkles or puckering that's going to happen. And so uh, after I got this piece, I have starched this with some magic sizing, uh, the magic quilt spray, the um, material magic that I mix with water. Okay, um, liquid starch that I've mixed with water, anything along that lines just to give this a little bit more body that's there. Okay, all right. First things first is we are going to fuse the hill to our background fabric. Okay. And let me get all the pieces together here. Okay. Getting the paper off the back of a fused piece. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. So the first thing you typically do is you start picking at the end, okay, or at the edge. And that is not going to be the best choice because then right now the edges are all nice and fused. They're not frayed or anything along that lines. So I'm going to take a pin. I'm going to score through the middle, okay, and see if I can't get the paper to kind of tear. And now I can tear that paper off from the middle and not disturb any of that um, nicely sealed cut edge. I'm going to take my hill and I'm going to lay it at the bottom of my block. Now I'm going to protect my ironing board. Okay, because we are working with fusibles, I, you know, these could be slightly oversized um, in terms of where we get it. So I can see that's 
just a tad larger there. So if I were to fuse this down, I'm gonna, that would actually fuse to my ironing board and then trying to get it off. And then something else will get laid there and then it'll get fused down and it just won't, just won't be pretty, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and get that laid there. I'm gonna use a warm iron and I'm just gonna set that down for like a count of five. Now you can see I'm just setting my iron down. I'm not moving it back and forth. I'm just setting it down and getting it sealed. Okay. Is this the first applique fusible project for anyone? Um, it's been a while since I've, well, not super long. What I have put down on the table here, this is a Teflon sheet, a pressing mat, okay? Um, I would recommend that this may be something that you want to get when we start to assemble um, our pieces because we can actually fuse to this and the fusible doesn't stick to this applique fusing mat, okay? I'm waiting for more to arrive and then we'll have some in the store um, for us as well, okay? Next up, we're going to need, now that he's all sealed on there, next up, we're going to need the diagram that was in the middle of the book, okay? And it is open to the Shamrock Ridge um, placement. Okay. I'm going to get some more light over here. I feel like it's dark. Give me one second. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we need to sta stack up all these pieces where she tells us to, okay? And we can do that right on our fabric if we want. I mean, obviously you know how to build your house. You can reference the picture on the uh, front of the book for it as well, but if you are a little more like, I like it to look exactly how she planned for it to be, you can do a couple of things. One, you can take and place this under your applique pressing mat, okay? And you can see your house and things through it, okay? So give me one second, I'm going to get a pair of scissors so I can cut the chimney off the house. Okay. So I'm just going to come in. I'm just going to run right next to it. Line my chimney up. Peel that off, I'm gonna kind of set it in place. I'm gonna take my iron and I'm just gonna kind of tap it so that it holds to the mat. Okay, so now it's not really gonna move on me. Okay, I'm gonna take my roof. And we're just going to work, you know, back to front more than anything. You can always reference the book, the picture on the front cover. As to how things are done. Okay. 
seal that up. I'm going to put this down first. Lay that down. The main goal at this roof piece is to just make sure you've covered the raw edges that we have um, of the green of our main house piece. Now, when I iron this piece, this roof line down, it's going to fuse to fabric. So there's not going to be any removing or repositioning that. And so if you work on an ironing board as well, if you need to, you can always put straight pins straight down into things so that you can um, keep it there while you pick your iron up and move it or something along that lines if you have um, that type of thing. So that will help kind of hold that particular piece in place. Now, what comes next is going to be, you're not going to be able to see through this to know where to put your doors and windows. Okay. So there's a couple of things that you can do. One, eyeball it. Just go with it. Okay. See if you can, you know, figure out your placement as to what you want, where you want it. One second. Press this one more time. I'm going to peel this off my mat. If you have a light box, or you can go up to the window. Oops. You can go up to the window before you fuse your pieces on or anything like that. And you can, it's hard for you guys to see here, but I can see it enough that I can mark at least a corner of where the, the window should go. Okay, so a light box will be helpful. It's hard to see here, but promise you you can see I just made a few little marks as to the placement of my windows. I'm going to bring my house back. Line them back up here. Gonna find my baggie that has all my pieces in it. Got my door. You can always kind of lift up and be like, yep, that's pretty close. Stick it 
stick him there for a moment. Now we have a couple of different size windows that is happening here. And so if you look at the front, you've got the big window is down here behind your sheep. You have two rectangular, medium sized rectangular windows and the smallest one is at the top. Okay, so again, to, to take out those connectors, I'm just clipping right next to them. That's my smallest window. While I'm at it, I'm going to go ahead and take care of my sheep because I can see him here. His legs. It's good to work with a trash can or a small um, thread catcher next to you so that you can throw all your paper pieces away and then the paper doesn't get on your ironing board and cluttered. Quite a few on there now, so I'm just going to take my iron. Now I did mark on this with a friction pen so that when I ironed over it, the friction pen disappeared. Okay. That is our house. Okay. All the pieces to our house. The last piece here is just the heart of this little guy, you can put him on however you would like, right, yep. Okay. Now 
gonna slide that over and we're gonna build our shamrock that we have. Okay. And then and we'll get them to our background. I'm just going to move that out of the way for a minute. It's your block. It doesn't have to match up exactly to the lines that are under there. It's okay. If you get it in the general vicinity. Come back and put that gold buckle on in just a minute. Once I get that down. Okay. There is a flower that's going to go up here, and then there is one shamrock that's going to overlap on the hat. Um, between the sheep and the hat, but we don't want that on yet because we don't have it on our background. So now that we have that finished, we're going to get our background back out. Carefully peel up my house unit. Okay. I'm going to look at the book and just give me an idea as to how and where this was. Make sure you leave yourself seam allowances across all the edges. He looks to be closer down um, at the bottom here so that he's almost sitting on our um, checkerboard.
one more shamrock around here. I'm pretty happy with how this looks. This little flower guy up here is going to get a stem that we're going to bring over. This little guy down here, he's going to get a stem in his mouth as well. I don't have anything that is too close to the edge. Got plenty of seam allowance. Make sure my house is sitting straight. So I'm gonna get a ruler here. There we go. Now he's straight. Once I'm happy and I am good with it, I am going to start fusing this down to the background. Just carefully lifting the iron and setting it down in the next location. If you drag your iron across this, it's very likely that something is going to move and then get ironed down where you didn't intend for it to be ironed. Okay. I also like to, once I have it attached, flip it over and hit it from the backside so that the iron is closer to the glue. Now I have one of all my block is fused, okay, for Shamrock Ridge. I'm going to go over to the sewing machine and we're going to talk about blanket stitching those particular um, blocks, okay. Let's talk about the um, stitches that could be used with your blanket stitch. Okay. So I am going to talk from the world of Bernina because that's what we are, but feel free to, this all applies to your machine as well. First thing that we're going to do is choose a presser foot. Okay. What foot, well, excuse me. First thing we're gonna do is decide what kind of stitch we're gonna do here. Okay. If you're going to blanket stitch, are you going to straight stitch around the edge? Are you going to do some sort of decorative stitch? that type of thing. Are you going to um, do it by machine? You're gonna do it by hand? Are you gonna use thread colors to complement, thread colors to match? Are you gonna do um, the traditional all black? Completely your choice. I'm gonna teach you blanket stitch because that is my preferred method, but you could, if you were a a quilter, well, you're a quilter. If you machine quilt, you could very well just leave these raw edge. And then once you have them layered, you could run your quilting and do that stitching close to the edge. Um, if you know the name McKenna Ryan, um, big in um, the batik world, does a lot of this type of fusible applique. And in her projects, 
they're just fused and then the quilting is what is done on the quilt to hold those pieces in place. So there is another, another option there. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a presser foot. I am going to use foot number 20. So 20 or 20C or 20D, depending upon your machine, um, is an open foot. Okay, so there's no bar through the middle. Okay, it is. Um, there so that you can um, see what you're doing per se so that everything is um, one second. Um, not being blocked your point of view is not being blocked in any way so I'm going to use foot 20 we also in the Bernina world have some clear versions not of the 20, but we have a number 34, 34C, 34D, and then 39 and 39C. Those are clear versions of a, a standard presser foot. So let me show you. So if I show you 34. So everything, the foot looks like this, except it's clear. And so you can still see. Um, where you're going and what you're doing. I just prefer there not to be that middle bar. Then I'm going to choose my blanket stitch. Depending upon your machine is going to depend upon where it lives. Um, if you have a newer Bernina, the blanket stitch lives in the quilt block stitch tab. And 1329 is going to be the um, stitch that you want. 1329 is a single blanket stitch. And if you look at there um, on the screen, we have 1330, which is a double blanket. Okay. So you could um, do either one of those particular ones. Okay. A double blanket just means it makes it darker, thicker, it goes over the edge twice. Okay. You'll also find that you have 1345, which is a reversed double blanket. Okay. You also have lots of other stitches that would work for this as well. Um, feather stitches, like 1332 could work. I'm going to show you 1329. We're going to take my needle position. So I'm going to move my needle to the far right hand side. If I was trying to stitch this at the moment with my needle in center, I don't really know where center is because I got rid of that middle bar of my presser foot. So I have no idea where to guide, right? So if I move my needle to the far right, Now I can guide my raw edge or my applique edge on the inside edge of that toe of the number 20 or um, any of the presser foot feet or that you may choose to use. Okay. I'm going to make some, you can make some adjustments to the width of the stitch. And so width refers to how far this, um, stitch jumps into your applique and length you can make adjustments based upon how often you want that stitch to jump into. So we're going to come over to the machine here. There we go. And we're going to look at a couple of different um, settings. So I have on my number 20. Okay. Um, let me do one thing. I turn off. Okay. I don't like to start in the corner of something. I prefer to start down. Okay. Um, 
but that is again personal preference as to what and where you would like to begin. Get my needle threaded. Now in my bobbin I just have neutral thread. Okay, Nothing fancy. You shouldn't see it on the top of your project. It's all going to be underneath. So a lot of times I will use my applique projects as bobbin empty projects. So I will um, use all different types of colors in my bobbin uh, for this, but now if you have a Bernina, your freehand system is going to be your best friend, okay? So that's that metal bar that you can use with your right knee to raise and lower the foot, okay? And that way, you, when you go to pivot a corner or around a shape, you can do that without having to raise and lower the presser foot by taking your hands off and pressing a button or coming around the back of the machine and raising and lowering the foot there. Okay. So I'm going to start stitching here. So the green is my applique. I have him following the inside of this particular toe. And I'm just stitching. And so the way that the stitch works, it comes down and then it goes in, back out, and then down. And you have to kind of get to know that rhythm because when it comes to turning corners or things along that lines, we need to know where we are in the stitch. And so I just stopped. I'm at almost at the corner. I just jumped back over. My next stitch is going to jump forward and that's going to put me exactly at the corner. Okay. So at this point, what's going to happen? So I'm at the corner. I've also got my machine stopping with the needle in the down position. Okay. So I'm at the corner. I can take the next stitch, which is going to stitch across and back, and then I'll stop. Or I can pivot now, take the stitch, and then come back and start down. I think I'm actually going to take the stitch here. Now I'm going to pivot, and the next thing the machine is going to do is come forward. Okay, take the stitch. cut my thread here. Now I didn't tie a knot or do any locking up here at the beginning. I don't like to back stitch when I am, and I'm going to change bobbin threads because the bobbin thread I have in here is polyester and I have cotton in the machine. messing with my tension. Now, I don't like to back stitch like I was saying. I prefer to when I come back around to where I'm ending, um, I prefer to go past and secure that stitch okay, at that point. So let me do this again. Now, if you are having problems with your bobbin thread coming to the top, how do you fix it? What do you need to do? Okay. So, depending upon the machine that you are on, my um, Bernina 8 Series machines, we would thread the, the bobbin like for embroidery. Okay, my fives, my four fives and sevens that use the larger black bobbin that have the B9 hook in it, 
Um, you may want to invest in a gold bobbin case, and gold is color, not the metal it's made out of. Um, <laughs> it is a high tension bobbin case. So it pulls tighter on your upper thread. If you are a classic or a legacy machine, you may have a couple of things. If you are a classic machine like a 640 or a 730, a 200, that has the bobbin case with um, has this bobbin case where there's a, a hole right here. You probably have a bobbin case that has a little pigtail on it that you would have used for machine embroidery and you want to use that. If you are the uh, legacy machines, uh, the classic 135, 240s, things along that lines that have a bobbin case like this that has a little stitch finger. Um, what we do is, let me get a bobbin. We thread that stitch finger. And for some of you, that may be something you have never done. <laughs> so you're going to thread your bobbin like you normally would. You're going to, I'm going to get a clean end. So my bobbin is threaded. I'm going to take the thread tail. I'm going to go from the back of the bobbin case through that hole in the bobbin, the stitch finger. Um, I believe there are high tension bobbin cases in stock. Yes. So there, let me get my hand out of the way. So my thread goes from the back through the, the hole in the stitch finger and out through the front. And that tightens up your bobbin case tension. And that's going to help keep the um, bobbin underneath your project, not coming up to the top. Now, if I was doing a round object or an object that has points like we have here, when you do curves and things along that lines, we're going to be stitching and then taking a stitch, stopping, always stopping with your needle on the outside of your applique. And then we will continue around taking a stitch and then pivoting and take a stitch and pivot. So I want to come back to the beginning here and then we will um, stitch one on the project. Okay, I'm coming down to the corner. So I'm going to jump forward and that's going to give me Needle down, so my next stitch is going to go left and then back to right. And then I'm going to stop because my next stitch is going to come forward. And what's going to happen is if I come forward, it's going to come off the fabric. So I'm going to lift it up and adjust it so that it would stay at the edge of my fabric. All right. I'm coming back to the beginning of my project. My next stitch is going to connect to the first stitch that I did. So I'm going to activate the knot function on my machine. Okay, so I'm going to push a button and I'm going to take a stitch. And it's going to take a few stitches in place and then that will be secure. If you're not loving the knot function on your machine, you can, don't use your scissors, raise your foot, pull your fabric out, and cut yourself a tail, and then you can feed your tail to the underside and manually tie a knot. Okay. 
There's your blanket stitch. Now you'll see, you see how it is a little ripply? Okay, this background fabric wasn't starched. Okay, it was just out of the scrap bin, was not starched. If it was starched, it may not ripple. <coughs> if your fabric is starched and you're still getting ripples, you may want to use a lightweight tearaway on the underside of your project, okay? And then you can tear it off when you're finished to help eliminate um, some of that rippling that's happening. Okay. Questions about your blanket stitch? I am going to go grab a spool of thread here because that was one thing I did not do before because I honestly hadn't made a decision as to whether I was going to match or complement or make it all one color and make my life easier. But all right, I think that's the one I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use isocord thread for my project. For stitching it, it's gonna blend in. Um, it's a 40 weight polyester. I just, I personally have way more thread colors in isocord than I do in cotton, but you can mix and match. Just know that if you do some things in your isocord and some things in your cotton, that there is going to be a difference in the look of them. The weight of them is different. So you'll have a, one of them will probably be more visible than the other. So whatever you decide to do, just note that. You can always test it out with scrap as well. Okay. Um, it's up to you. I'm going to stitch it right now about stabilizer. We're going to see if I think it needs it. Okay. So I'm going to look. We're going to stitch this clover right here. And I'm going to kind of look at what I have going on and where to start and what I'm going to do. And so. I think I'm going to stay small, so I'm going to use the default settings that are on our stitch to do this particular, um, this portion, okay? Because this stem is tiny, um, and if I get too far in, then both sides are going to end up meeting inside of this particular area. So if I start here, I can pretty much make it all the way around without having to cut my thread, okay? And so that's kind of one thing that I look at. So I'm gonna come down, I'm gonna pull my bobbin thread. Maybe help if I put my glasses on. I could probably see better. Hmm. Okay. And now my machine says no. Okay. So while the machine restarts, we'll talk about the green one, the big green clover. So I've got this small section right here that's gonna have to be stitched. I'm gonna have to break my, knot my thread and then come do this section and knot my thread. And then I'm gonna go all the way around and then I can repeat the process there. So when I am doing this stitching, I kind of just, randomly do things by whatever color I have in the machine. So 
for me, I would um, do everything. I would blanket stitch everything with this particular color now. So if I was going to do this green and my house and my chimney, I would just go through and do all that blanket stitching. There's really not a um, need to do things in particular back to front order or anything along that lines. I usually just start with a thread color and then do everything with that thread color. There we go. Pull my bobbin thread to the top. So on a blanket stitch, the first stitch is going to come down. Oh, Jiminy Crickets. One second. And it's going to jump over. Okay, so I'm at a point that I need to pivot just slightly because we're starting around the curve. Okay, now I'm back over and now I'm going to pivot some more and we're going to get to this particular straight edge. Always making sure that your needle is down in the background fabric before you do any sort of movement. Because if I move while my needle's in the applique, when it jumps back out, it's not going to line up with the stitch that it did to go into the applique. Now, blanket stitching is not a fast thing, well, especially when you have lots of shapes. But it's not, it's, I don't know, it's mindless stitching in my world, what I would call mindless stitching. something I can usually turn the TV on and be listening to. And don't be afraid to <clears throat> adjust the stitch width while you are stitching. Like I feel like around that top corner here it needs to be a little smaller. As you go along and do this, it will get faster and easier for you. Uh, needle size that I have in machine is just a 7511 or an 8012. Something sharp. You don't want, um, you've got at places multiple <clears throat> layers of fusible.
So far it's laying pretty flat <clears throat> with the starch on the background. You could also, if you wanted, um, you didn't want to do, maybe didn't want a tearaway stabilizer to put behind there. And it just needs to be a lightweight tearaway. So <clears throat> in my world here at Material Girls, that's going to be OESD's lightweight tearaway or ultra clean and tear. Um, those are machine embroidery stabilizers, but that's pretty much what we're doing here is we're just doing traditional machine embroidery with decorative stitches. You could also, if you wanted, um, fuse a piece of fusible woven to the back side of this um, piece once you had it pieced together. So you could add a layer of SF-101. It's not going to hurt it. And use that instead of your um, tearaway stabilizer. I would also make note as to the thread colors that you're using on each fabric so that you will be able to um, know which one that you used if you want them to be the same from block to block. Take a little scrap, tape it to a piece of paper or an index card, and then write your thread color on it. Blanket stitching is something that you can just like, I don't know, I pick it up and I do one color and then I move on to something else. It's not, I don't traditionally sit down and, and blanket stitch for hours on time, which is kind of like a work in progress. In between maybe, you know, piecing a bunch of units for another quilt you just want to take a break from that project, pick up one of your blocks, okay, right in the corner, and then you always get excited when you get back to a point where you got a nice long straight edge. function. Okay. Cut my thread. Question is, if I have to hand blanket stitch, um, yes, I would put a little starch before. It's, it don't, you don't need to make it stiff like paper. It's just going to add just enough body for you to be able to hold this in your hand. Okay? Doesn't need to be solid as a piece of paper. Let's go and look at this. One second. So, yeah, I would... I love that you're going to hand hand do it. And again, 
hand stitching is great. I would probably hand stitch this if I wasn't already doing a massive English paper piecing project. And that's going to need to be the thing that goes on the go with me. All right. So you can see on the back side here, there is my stitching on the back. My blanket stitch on the front. Um, if you're going to hand do it, I would probably, um, if you're going to use embroidery floss, probably two strands of embroidery floss, I would test it just to make sure that it's not too bold or bulky um, on your project. Um, that type of thing. So two to three strands, probably more like two, I think would give you, two strands would give you the same look, I think, as what you would get with thread on the machine. So there is the blanket stitch, okay? So I just tried to find a location and work from there. I would, so when it comes down to, let's talk about, let's talk about this guy here, this hat. So I'm gonna do the brown around the top, and I'm going to do the brown around the bottom here. This section that's right here is probably going to be a few stitches of this blue. Okay. And then I'm going to do green here with the rest of this. Okay. Yeah. With my sheep, I'm probably going to do the same color here and here. So I may um, just come back and do those. My door, I'm going to go all the way around the door. So I'm going to do green up to this section of the door and then continue with green here and up. And then I want to show you how to do the window panes and your um, stems if you're not really into wanting to do this by hand embroidery okay so this little this little guy has got a stem that comes from here to here we have our window panes and we have a stem that goes from here to here so i want to show you how to do those by sewing machine mm -hmm. and not have to do it by hand okay if you're not into doing it by hand and that's the last thing that goes on the block is the, um, is the hand embroidery. And I would hold buttons for after, um, after the quilting is finished. Okay, so I wouldn't put any buttons on your project until after you have the whole quilt machine quilted. Okay, because, well, I mean, as long as you weren't intending to quilt in this flower, and you could put the button on, but just so that your long armor doesn't run over it or anything along that lines, you can um, just leave them off and we'll do them by sewing machine uh, when it comes back from the long armor. Yes, I will let you know as soon as those fuse applique mats come in, soon as they walk in the door. Um, I'm hoping this week I am, where is my, oh, here's my example. Okay. All right. On your machines, traditionally this um, stitching that would go in the window panes and in the um, stems and things along that lines. She has you embroider a back stitch. And then, uh, yeah, she has you do it with a back stitch. And a French knot for the sheep's eyes. With the back stitch stitch, the, I would use, on the machine a triple stitch okay 
So triple stitch on your machine is going to probably be somewhere around your straight stitch that um, is there for you to use. Okay. It is basically a straight stitch that stitches over itself three times. So let me show you what that looks like. You can play with your stitch length, um, adjust it as you want. Um, that's there, but let's take a look. Yeah, I believe I have gold bobbin cases in stock. I won't know until I get back down to the store floor down there. We don't have them up online, <clears throat> but, but I'm pretty sure I hung some up the other day. This is something that you're going to want to test on fabric because th this may be an area that you do want to put a sliver of stabilizer behind just because of the pure thickness of this particular fabric, I mean particular stitch. And depending upon what thread that you stitch it with is going to give you a different look, okay? So I'm going to stitch the first one here with um, Isocord, my 40 weight polyester. Now I would take my project and I would mark lines with a heat erasable marker, okay? And then basically we would just stitch right over those lines. And so you can see it basically stitches back and forth over itself. three times okay. I'll change um, cameras here in a second and show you I want to stitch another one in a heavier weight thread so that you can see the difference thread the needle today. Goodness gracious, it's because you're all watching me. <laughs> I have all eyes watching me. That is a triple stitch. Looks very much like a machine hand stitch. Okay, by, like a back stitch done by hand. This here is polyester, 40 weight polyester. And this one here is 28 weight cotton. Okay, so there is a visual difference between them. Now that was done on top of fabric, on top of an applique, okay, so there is two layers of fabric here, um, but when it comes to your particular project, when we stitch this stem here, it's only on the um, one layer of fabric. And so you may want to test that to make sure that this doesn't pucker if you do it by uh, machine, okay? 
and then that will be your stem. So I would draw that little guy right there. Let's look at that. You can see. And so she starts it down a little here. Let's hold on, zoom out so you can see it. Here, stitches up and then comes up and over. Your choice. This is your little flower. If you don't even want him on there because you're like, I'm not even going to want to do that hand stitching, leave it off. Nobody says he has to be here. You can put him closer. You can wait until you have all this and then play with where he's at before you fuse him down so that you can figure out uh, what shape you want that stem to be or anything along that lines. Okay. All right. Now we have that done. Okay, let's see. I think I see some questions over here. Um, with the, so question about thread in my bobbin. With the isocord in my bobbin, I'm using isocord with isocord on top of the machine upper thread. I'm using isocord in my bobbin. If I am using um, cotton in my upper half, I have cotton, the same weight cotton in the lower. Now, if I'm going to use that 28 weight cotton, I'm not going to put 28 weight cotton in my bobbin case. I'm going to use the um, 40 or a 50 weight cotton in my bobbin case. I don't like to put 28 weight in there because it's too heavy and it could uh, play with your, throw your tension off um, in general. So when it comes to the 28 weight, I'm just going to use the 50 weight that's in my bobbin, okay, without a problem. And the 8012 needle with the 28 weight um, works fine as well. Okay, let's look at, so we wrap some things up here. I just want to look at some of the piecing techniques that are done in the three blocks for our project. Okay, so I'm going to set this to the side. So once I have all of this applique, I'm going to take my um, pieced unit, right sides together, quarter inch seam, and attach that um, there. Okay. That block should measure 12 and a half inches when you are finished. Okay, approximately 12 and a half. If it's a little short, it's okay. All your blocks will probably be the same. <laughs> okay. Disappearing four patch. Okay, we're going to take the two rectangles that we cut for this particular project. We're going to over to the machine and I'm going to change feet to a quarter inch pressing foot. And I'm going to sew this together down one long edge in just a moment. I don't want to sew it with 28 weight thread. OK. 
Okay. Quarter inch. I'm going to take this, I'm going to go press this seam here, and we're going to press the seam towards the, um, towards the darker fabric. So because I'm going to press towards the darker fabric, I'm going to put the dark fabric on the ironing board right side up, or I mean the wrong side of the dark fabric up on the ironing board set the seam and then we will press that okay now we're going to go and we're going to cut this unit in half okay so i believe he was eight inches we're going to cut him in half to be four inches What did I do with my ruler? Goodness gracious. So let me just verify. Yep, eight. So I'm going to come over. I'm going to cut this in half. I'm going to put the seam right on a line so that I can make sure that it's straight. I'm going to verify. Four inches. Okay. And we're going to take this, we're going to rotate it, and we're going to make a four patch. I'm going to put this right sides together. We're going to nest the seam into each other. And we're going to go sew this at a quarter of an inch. Now, if you received, if you're part of the Material Girls group, you received your email, and in the email there was a note about a possible typo in your pattern. Okay. Um, for most of the ones, I believe, uh, because we do the patterns, I believe, that were in your kits were... Um, second edition prints because they were all booklets that are uh, they're booklets and not pattern envelopes um, your correction is your book is correct at least mine was but um, verify that information um, you can find this pattern correction here on art2heart.com under corrections and you'll find this bit um, it's not anything to do with cutting, it's just a diagram and um, telling uh, wording is uh, the change. And you probably would have caught it um, either way. But it's part of the, the issue is the, um, in the shamrock block piecing. Okay, we're going to go to the iron and we're going to press this open not open i'm going to swirl press the center and so if you've never done a swirl press before i'm going to take and i'm going to remove the two or three stitches that are in the seam allowance vertical to the seam that we just sewed And so what that's going to allow me to do is when I go over to the iron, I'm going to be able to push them in opposite directions. I'm going to get this little itty baby four patch here in the middle. 
and we are going to um, get a nice flat seam, not anything bulky. So again, it's going to allow me to press the seams opposite directions. You got a four patch. Now it's a disappearing nine patch. So with the nine patch means that we do cut it again. So you're going to take your block and she tells you in the pattern that you are going to cut one and a quarter inches from the middle seams. Okay that are shown in the diagram. So I'm basically going to go an inch and a quarter, and I'm not going to use that ruler because he doesn't have good marked inch and a quarter lines. Okay. So I'm going to go an inch and a quarter from the center seam okay. here. I'm going to go an inch and a quarter the other direction. It's good to do this like standing on a corner of a table. Okay. We're going to go an inch and a quarter from the top to the top or from the middle seam up. One second, let me just make sure I'm... Okay. Double check myself. <laughs> and then an inch and a quarter down. And then we're going to lay it out just like the diagram shows. Okay, so Lay it out just like your diagram. Ultimately, what you want is nothing should be sewing to itself. So this should not be happening. You shouldn't be sewing it back to the same fabric um, before. So that is our disappearing nine patch that started with two rectangles. Okay, so I would sew these each row together with a quarter inch seam. Um, I would press away from the middle, into the center, away from the middle. That way these points will all nest into each other. Once you have that assembled, that will get trimmed up to a six and a half inch square. Okay. That is that one. If we look at the square and the square block, You're going to take your two center squares, your two green fabric squares. You're going to cut them in half diagonally. Now, <clears throat> she notes that if the block is a directional fabric, okay, and this is technically a directional fabric, that you should cut the diagonals in opposite directions, okay. So I'm going to lay my directional fabric out. I'm going to cut one fabric 
this direction. And I'm going to cut the other fabric this direction. And then there we go. If you get it right, all of them will go in the same direction, or if it doesn't matter to you, don't fuss over it. <clears throat> what we need to do is we're going to find the middle. And so I would take your, your three and a half inch square. need to find the middle on each edge because we're going to take and fold the triangles and match middle to middle okay and then sew quarter of an inch and press out and then match middle to middle middle to middle okay this unit should be four and three quarters inch square once you have sewn it. Okay, so it is it it's going to be slightly larger than that measurement. When you are trimming this to four and three quarters inches square, make sure that you are keeping a quarter of an inch beyond each of those points. You don't want to go less than a quarter of an inch from each of those points because then you're going to lose the point in the seam allowance. Okay. And then we're going to do the same with the other two squares. This one's not directional. <clears throat> so you'll have that trimmed. And then we're going to repeat this process this direction. Okay, opposite sides press away from center, opposite sides press away from center. When you are done, this is to be trimmed to six and a half. Again, making sure that you give yourself a quarter of an inch at each of those intersections so that you don't lose your points. Okay, that's that one. And then the last block is a folded corner, which is, keep losing things. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to make three four patches. Okay, so you're going to use your greens. to make three four patches. And you may want to lay them out kind of how I'm doing here. Let me zoom that out so you can see. So this is my shamrock, okay? There's gonna be a stem that goes in here. So if you lay out your four patches like this, you kind of get an idea as to if you need to rearrange or look at the direction of a piece of fabric. Maybe that needs to be here and like that needs to be a little farther away here. Oh. No, I like that there. Oh, don't like that. Okay, I'm not going to mess with it. I could spend hours laying here doing this. <laughs> okay, you're going to take your stem, okay, that's the big square. We are going to take the larger squares of background. And we are going to draw a line from corner to corner. Okay. 
I have a line. I'm going to lay that in one corner and I'm going to stitch on that line. Okay. We will stitch on that line, trim the dog ear a quarter of an inch off, and that's going to give us this. Okay. We're going to repeat that process in the opposite corner so that we get our shamrock stem. Okay. He should be a three and a half inch square when you're finished. These guys, we're going to make the three four patches. Okay. Sew the twos together and then sew the twos to, to fours. I would just press the seams opposite directions, it doesn't matter. And then I would look at the book and we're going to add a folded corner to three sides of each four patch. Okay, so again, we're going to take the smaller squares, we're going to sew a lot, draw a line from corner to corner, place it in the correct corner, sew on it, and then fold back. Okay, so you may want to lay out each of the four patches to make sure they are going in the right direction for how you planned. And then place your corners on. Okay. And that way you can make sure that if the whole unit needs to be rotated or the, you know, if you don't lay it out first, what's going to happen is you're going to sew these on and then something's going to land next to a matching fabric. So I would lay it out completely. Again, each of these should be three and a half inches square. And then once you have your units made, you're going to, this is like a big four patch, this to this, this to this, and then sew through the middle and you'll have one shamrock. Questions? Questions at all? Because once that's done, your blocks are finished for this month. One second, there we go. Your blocks are finished and then you can spend a little time getting your blanket stitching complete um, and things like that. So it's very basic piecing that we will have um, every month and then the hardest part is going to be the, the blanket stitching. And it's not really hard, it's just the most time consuming um, portion of the project, but the end result is going to be beautiful. And like I tell, like I tell everybody, there is no expiration date on the project. If it's not finished by the end of the month, it's okay. It's absolutely okay. Um, we just want to keep you moving. We want to see the project finish um, as uh, what well, would be nice to finish it at the time that it rolls around um, in a year, but there's plenty of time. Some months are busier than others. It's okay. Um, I'll tell you, I will probably be the first one to tell you that I don't, didn't finish a particular block um, um, that month. So just bear with me too because I get a little busy. <laughs> and sometimes the blanket stitching doesn't happen. But all right, everybody. Well, I thank you so much for joining me today. And I appreciate you um, hanging out with me. And if you have any questions, um, you know where to find me. This video will stay up here on YouTube. It's not going to go anywhere. You can always email us at, um, I'm putting it in the chat right now, at materialgirl at verizon.net. We even have a text line. If you text us um, at this number, uh, 240-527-0215. Text me your question. Um, just make sure that you reference Wander Lane um, and we'll happily get back to you or I can find um, any sort of additional information and answer your question. So again, we just want you to be happy and successful. 
Well, I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Thank you again so much for joining us and I'll see you back here next month for the next section of our Wander Lane, which I believe is Bunny Knoll. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.